Thanks, Sam, and <clears throat> thank you all the organizers, especially Mark Geyer and uh, Igor. It's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, but it's a very sad pleasure. That sounds like an oxymoron. Um, as far as NIH goes, I just got an email telling me what I'm supposed to say. So. <laughs> I'll let you figure out the rest of it. So, um, Athena Marku was an intimate part of my life, and I'd like to think I was an intimate part of her life. She was my PhD student, so you see the early cube there in the center. She was a postdoctoral fellow with us, and you see her on the left-hand side with some of my other uh, pre-doctoral fellows. Uh, Lisa Gold is here today. Um, um, Brian Baldo is here today. He's not in this picture. Neil Swerdlow is here today. Uh, Neil was my first PhD student. Athena was my uh, Lisa was my second, and I think Athena was my third. Um, and Lisa, if I got it wrong, then you can correct me later. And then uh, the third photo is a picture of Athena with Floyd Bloom, the chairman of our Department of Neuropharmacology. And Athena was recruited as a faculty member there before she was recruited by Lou Judd over here at, at uh, UCSD. So what I'd like to do today is just tell you a little bit about the impact Athena had on my work and the impact that the work she did had on my work and how she followed through on that in, in later part of her career. And it has had really a seminal contribution not only to my work but to the work in the addiction field. So, so this, is a, this is addiction from a neurobiological perspective. Barry will probably talk about that blue blob there and, and incentive salience and and habits and cues and something like that in, in the next talk. I'm gonna focus a little bit today on the extended amygdala and the dark red part and Athena's contributions to that part of, of, of uh, the addiction cycle, the reward deficit and the stress surfeit part. And, and many of you know that there's a huge contribution of frontal cortex um, dysfunction to the addiction process. So one of the ways that I've conceptualized addiction is that there are both elements of impulsivity and compulsivity. And compulsivity is a little bit difficult to define. There are a lot of people who define it, but basically continuing to respond vigorously for a drug in the face of adverse consequences is one of the simple definitions. But it is a, there is a multiple components to compulsivity, and one of the things we've noted is that in terminal alcoholics in particular, but in individuals who really become addicted, negative reinforcement kicks in. So, so what is negative reinforcement? Well, this is a, a term that is not used much by anybody except me, all right? And it really refers to uh, increase in the probability of a response to avoid something aversive, okay? So to put it in your terms, everybody in this room just about, the first time you get a grant, it's highly rewarding. Okay, and once you've hired everybody on that five-year grant and it's time for the renewal, the next time you get the grant, there's a celebration, but most of it is relief. And the third time you get the grant, you're desperate because you're going to have to fire everybody in the lab if you don't get it renewed. And it's been 10 years out and it's getting tricky. So that's an everyday version of negative reinforcement, okay? In addiction, the argument is that it's a very simple one. It's what goes up must come down. And so this is where Athena had a key role because when she was a PhD student, we started thinking about, well, what happens to the brain reward system when you take cocaine? Now, people like Elliot Gardner here in the front did some of the early seminal work showing, along with Conan Kornetsky, that, that drugs of abuse caused the reward system to go wild, to put it simply. In other words, they would facilitate, lower the thresholds for brain stimulation. But Athena and I, thinking about this, and so I want to emphasize the thinking part of Athena today, thinking about this, we wanted to ask the question, what happens if you take a lot of cocaine? And the argument we, was predicated on an old hypothesis by Richard Solomon that there's an after effect, that there's some kind of adjustment of the brain reward system to excessive activation. 
And so this is the really seminal paper. This was 1981, uh, 91, sorry. So you, you can look, it's almost 30 years old, 25 years old. And, and this paper was so new and the journal it was published in was so new that it was cited as being in psychopharmacology for about 10 years, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. But what Athena showed is that the longer a rat took cocaine, the bigger the afterburn, the bigger the, the increase in reward threshold. So anything you see above there in the, in the white is dysphoria, if you'll permit me. Athena liked the word anhedonia. I like the word hypohedonia, because I'm not sure the rats were completely anhedonic. And they were rats for the first in the first place, so who knows what they were really thinking. We went on, uh, Athena and I and other postdoctoral fellows, to show that every major drug of abuse, Paul Kenny was one of the contributors to the work with nicotine, which you'll see. And we went on, and the THC over there in the right-hand bottom corner is, is Elliot Gardner's seminal work. But basically, we went on to show that in every major drug of abuse, when you took the drug away, the reward system was compromised. All right? This slide is complicated. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to tell you that this effect occurs the first time you excessively engage in a drug. And so the study we did is on the bottom with Athena. I just think it's one of my favorite studies. It's never cited because it's buried in, in this journal. Um, that for some reason, uh, maybe we used the wrong title. But the, the fact is, if you look here, these animals we did this with Ilum polis, these animals were allowed to self-administer cocaine for different amounts of time. So it, the baseline was what they were in reward thresholds normally. If you let them have 15 minutes of cocaine, 15 minutes of intravenous self-administration of cocaine, look at the left-hand panel there, you'll see a reduction in reward thresholds. The classic finding of Conan Kronetsky, Roy Wise, Elliot Gardner, everybody. Tony Phillips did this before. Um, before I got out of graduate school, okay? So that's the facilitation of reward. At, at two hours and 24 hours, you don't see that effect. But if, of access to cocaine. But if you then do it again uh, and let them have 20 injections, 15 minutes later, you have an even bigger effect, but there's a starting to see an increase in reward thresholds on the out times. And if you let them have 40 injections of cocaine, you see the reward facilitation, but now you see the anhedonia or hypohedonia. And if you let them have 80 injections of cocaine, which is equivalent to six hours, you don't see any facilitation or reward at 15 minutes. The system is already turned. And up in the top, and I'm not gonna go through these, are evidence of this in human studies where subjective response to cocaines were measured. And then we went on, and, and these studies, I think, are critically important for the way I think, but we let animals self-administer cocaine for extended access to the drug, and we actually, this was a study Paul Kenny did with us, and Serge Ahmed up in the right-hand corner, we actually measured brain reward thresholds before and after each session. And if you look at the top panel only, you can see that reward thresholds with cocaine parallel and follow the escalation in drug intake, all right? So we know now from animal models through the seminal work of Athena Marku that the reward system is compromised in the, in, in the process of engaging in enough drug taking to be labeled compulsive. And it accounts for all these negative emotional symptoms. So what is the mechanism? And this is the second major seminal contribution of Athena Marku. So if you look up on what's circled in red, you'll see her early work, but you'll also see that we start to um, make progress on what neurotransmitter systems cause this decrease in reward. And two things stand out. One is that you, you lose reward function like dopamine and changes in glutamatergic function, as Igor mentioned but you also gain the brain stress systems. And this is just nicotine. And by the way, Andre Brunzel is, was one of her postdoctoral fellows, and he's followed up a great deal in many of these studies. And the same goes for all the other major drugs of abuse. Again, the early work by Athena 
on cocaine, I circled in red. But we know that the reward system, dopamine, glutamatergic systems that drive dopamine, serotonin, are compromised from this neuropharmacological analysis, but the brain stress systems are recruited. And so Floyd Bloom and I, in a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago, hypothesized that these two kind of neuroadaptations occurred in the brain in addiction. I don't think we really knew at the time where this took place. We speculated the locus ceruleus had a major role. Um, probably still does have some role, but I think it's poor, more likely the noradrenergic system that projects from the ventral bundle that has some of these more motivational contributions. But now we know that the within system neuroadaptation is a compromised dopamine system, among others, and other reward transmitters. And the between system neuroadaptation involves neurotransmitters like corticotropin releasing factor, dynorphin, kappa system, massive amounts of data in animal studies to support this hypothesis. And so um, this is where my current work focuses. I still have a laboratory at the National Institute on Drug Abuse in Baltimore. We're still doing brain stimulation reward. We're still following the seminal work that Athena laid out. And we now have research programs in our lab, and there are many across the world, suggesting that we're learning a great deal about why we feel bad from what we know about how drug addiction makes you feel bad. And so some of the between system neuroadaptations are in the stress system, and I mentioned some of these. Um, there's exciting new work on glucocorticoids and the neuroimmune system. And we also know there are buffers to these stress systems, and these are the uh, neurotransmitters like NPY, nociceptin, endocannabinoids, and, and one emerging on the scene right now, believe it or not, is oxytocin. And so Athena contributed mightily to my conceptual framework of addiction, which is a reward conceptualization in the sense that I really believe that the reward system is compromised, as many, many others um, in this room have contributed to that kind of uh, theoretical position. But my argument is that the uh, opponent process remains intact. It's a set point that drives it below our normal hedonic state. And, and so ultimately, my argument is that a, a, an addicted individual is trying to claw their way back, claw their way back to a normal hedonic state. But in the process, it's a form of what they say in social psychology of misregulation, in the process, the hole keeps being dug deeper. And by no means does this, this position abrogate anybody else's position. Um, you'll see from talks that come later today that this just forms, in a sense, the background. And, and we know that it becomes very, very pronounced in individuals who are very, very addicted. So here's what I've said. Um, drug addiction represents a dysregulation of incentive salience, reward, stress, and executive function systems. Compulsive drug-like uh, uh, taking produces an elevation in re brain reward thresholds, <clears throat> which I call hypohedonia. Again, Athena called it anhedonia during withdrawal that drives another source of drug-seeking motivation, negative reinforcement. Compulsive-like drug taking produces a reduction in reward neurotransmission in the basal ganglia and a recruitment of brain stress neurotransmission in the extended amygdala that contribute to dysphoric-like responses and a negative emotional state to set up this negative reinforcement. And finally, brain stress response systems are hypothesized to be activated during acute drug intake, to be sensitized during repeated withdrawal, to persist into protected abstinence, and to contribute to the development, persistence, and relapse of addiction. And so Dr. Athena Marku made seminal contributions to our understanding of the pathophysiology of hypohedonia and psychiatric disease with her pioneering work using animal models of reward dysfunction. So I hope, Athena, that you are in the Elysian fields smiling on us today. And we miss you terribly. Thank you very much.